So, hi everyone, this is the recap lecture. One quick note, special thing about this lecture, if you could try to just maintain quietness, uh, just because the audio and the projector are kind of a pain in the ass, so you can hear uh, for the recording, that would be awesome. Otherwise, if I ask you guys to talk to your neighbor questions or anything, please feel free to do that. Um, yeah, as always, please ask a question anytime as I'm going through stuff, if anything doesn't make sense, especially since it's recorded, since those people can't ask questions. So uh, you're filling in for them. All right, cool. So uh, quick announcements. Uh, homework five is due tomorrow on Wednesday, and I'll release homework six tonight, and that'll be due uh, next Wednesday. If you have any questions about any of it, feel free to uh, go ahead and message in the Discord, and I'm happy to answer anything. All right, so crash course review recorded. Yay, so exciting. Uh, this will be kind of in four parts, um, excluding the introductions. So there'll be like a little introduction section, and then the first part will be pre-flop. I'll give some definitions about it. The second part will be pre-flop, and I'll tell you like what actions we actually do. Then the third part will be post-flop. We'll go back into definitions, and then the fourth part finally will be the actions in post-flop game that we've discussed thus far. Okay, and then finally there'll be a little bit of a conclusion about poker as a whole, which will be insightful. Uh, whatever. All right, cool. Uh, special thanks to Teo, by the way, before we start. Uh, he designed like kind of the main gist of these slides and did a really nice job of it. So, first thing is uh, in this introduction section, we cover the rules, of course, in the first lecture mainly. Uh, the main thing is poker is a five card game, right? That we want to use the best five card hand. That's how we define poker hands and they're rated in this fashion, right? We're going to have more than five cards, of course, by the time all of the community cards and our own cards come out, so we just desire to make the best five card hand out of these, all right? And of course, there's uh, ties that we can have too if people have the exact same five card hand, since there is no differentiation between suits, right? All we care is uh, of the rank of the cards, um, and the clubs are not about hearts, diamonds are not about spades, or anything of the sort. Um, of course, flushes and straight flushes, etc., are of course uh, the suit does matter what suit it is, uh, that they all look the same, but spades are not above hearts or anything like that. All right, cool. And so, um, specifically, we can use two from our hand and three from the board, or one from our hand and four from the board, or zero from our hand and five from the board. Pull just is, it's, it's just the best five card. Hand. All right, cool. We then did a brief discussion about what GTO is Nash equilibrium, GTO poker, etc., etc. What does that mean? Well, uh, this guy, John Nash, said that if you have a finite game, aka there's a finite amount of possible uh, variations, right? We know that the cards can be shuffled, dealt, uh, different stacks, etc. There's different variables, but there's a finite number of them. There's not an infinite number. And by Nash theorem, uh, we then know that it is you are able to play a version of the game that is completely unexploitable. Right? That means that uh, it's not necessarily, it wins the most, all we know is that it's unexploitable. You cannot possibly lose. Right? There are no weaknesses in the game. So therefore, your, uh, let me get a marker. At any given time, playing GTO poker, you have a uh, grade that is equal to zero EV. Right? You always have positive or really non-negative EV. Right? There's one case where you have zero EV. Right? When it's not actually positive, it's zero. What is that? Can anyone raise their hand? Can anyone tell me? Yeah? Other stuff, all GTO players. Exactly, we have other players uh, playing GTO as well. So when you have um, multiple GTO players, that's when you have a circumstance where you're exactly breaking even zero EV. Otherwise, you're playing against non-GTO people, you'll be positive. But you can be more positive playing an exploitative strategy. And so we'll be talking about different deviations we can make from GTO play in order to exploit to have higher EV than GTO. But Everything is grounded in our GTO strategy, so that way we are not being exploited ourselves. All right, cool. So, um, Nash equilibrium is the strategy, right? This is the GTO strategy. It's where uh, Nash equilibrium is where each player lacks an incentive to change this strategy, which is GTO, right? There's no incentive to change because you are, in fact, in the ideal situation if you're playing against a GTO opponent. That is equilibrium, when you both are making that zero EV because both of you are perfect. Um, and so that's what would happen uh, if you're at this Nash equilibrium state, which of course never happens. So we're trying to get as close as we can with deviations that we were even more profitable than if we were just in that state. All right, great. So with that, let's actually go into poker. Let's apply this GTO strategy to poker, and let's specifically see some deviations we can have. So because poker is such a complex game, and there's so many different deviations possible, we kind of create these heuristics. So we were able to group things together, so that way it's a lot easier to understand the game as a whole. And one of those is player types. So 
So there's these different player types, ranging from fish and regs, right? Fish considerably weak players and reg considerably more competent players. And all these different um, kind of interludes between them in determining what creates this player heuristic. And with those, we can uh, then define deviations, uh, which end up making us profitable. All right, so just go ahead, take a look at this slide, try to recall uh, from uh, the slides we've been through, the lectures we've been through, about what these different player types were. Okay, cool. So, with these player types in mind, uh, what do we want to be? We want to be both tight and aggressive. Okay, because tight and aggressive players are hell to play against. They really suck to play against. Because they always have something, even if they're decently tight, and they're aggressive against us, right? Which makes us, which puts us in really hard positions. And we want to put our opponents in difficult positions to be in. All right, great. So, uh, we want to be aggressive, we want to have a strong selection of hands, it makes it very hard for our opponents to play against it. It also not only makes it difficult for our opponents, it protects ourselves from getting bullied. So not only can they not be mean to us, we are mean to them, right? This is the best circumstance that we can be in. And so we want to um, have this uh, very large and exploitable weaknesses. We want to attack them, and we want to uh, play uh, in this fashion. Only if it's like really just completely different the way that they're playing do we want to kind of deviate from this tight and aggressive strategy. But really, in general, that's a pretty nice rule of thumb is we want to be tight and aggressive. So how do we become tight and aggressive? Well, uh, there's actually some math behind it. As most of poker, we can actually quantify that. And how we do that in this class is we use a HUD, right? Uh, when we're playing on poker now online, there's these two statistics we look at very commonly, VPIP and PFR, right? VPIP being the voluntarily put in call when you decide to put in money, not through the blinds, but by you clicking that bet button or call button, and PFR, uh, PFR uh, pre-thought raising, right? Which is where uh, you're actually deciding to open or three bet or something like that pre-thought. All right, cool. And so uh, with these statistics, you can then determine player types from these statistics, right? We've gone through these before, but generally we want to be an aggressive player, aka have a small gap between our VPIP and PFR, right? We want to have, uh, we want to be raising most of the time we're putting in pot, aka we're being aggressive, not passive and just calling a ton of the time and not actually raising. So we want to be aggressive and we also want to be on the tighter side, right? We only have a VPIP of 23 versus, as you can see, uh, fishes are generally going to have a loose pass fish has a VPIP of 40 or 70. And same thing when you get to like an aggro fish level 40, 40s or 70s. When you're in this 20s range, you're really playing great as a reg, even a little bit less than that. And generally, you want to have a small gap between your VPIP and PFR in order to be an aggressive player, right? That's what defines a type aggressive player. Yeah, question. What yeah, so VPIP is voluntarily put in pot. It's the proportion of the time that you are deciding voluntarily to click the call or raise button, and then PFR is uh, actually clicking that raise button, right? So we don't want to just be passively calling all the time, we want to be actively raising. And of course, it's uh, only like a quarter of the time, if even less than that, because we don't get good hands 80% of the time, right? So when you have this super high VPIP, you're voluntarily putting in your money uh, this often, we know that you're doing it with marginal to pretty poor hands. Cool. Nice. So uh, with this map in mind, we want to be a tight, aggressive player, right? We want to be putting money actively in the pot and being aggressive towards opponents. Let's get some definitions so that we know how to uh, bring that together to then actually uh, execute on these actions. So some definitions. First thing is position. Position is extremely important. We've talked about it a ton. And uh, here are the different positions we have, right? So it starts with the small blind and the big blind, the mandatory bets, and then it goes around with these labels, the under the gun player, high jack, cutoff, and button, right? Sometimes the under the gun player is also known as the low jack, uh, but it really depends on uh, if you're playing six max or eight max poker or nine max poker, and um, also like kind of where you're studying the button. But this is the general version that we use, and um, generally uh, the later in position you are, the better it is, because it's like rock, paper, scissors, right? You get to act second, we love acting second in rock, paper, scissors, right? So it's exactly like that concept. All right. <clears throat> so position is extremely important, as I said. A couple of reasons why. You get an information advantage, rock, paper, scissors. You also have greater flexibility, right? Because it's your decision to make after your opponent makes their decision first. So you have the flexibility of deciding what to do. Uh, and by going last, you know what your opponents did, right? That's super powerful. This is the rock, paper, scissors example. And uh, yeah, this is the flexibility of we can choose whether to fold or give up. And we'll be talking about this in reference to ghost equity uh, towards the end of this lecture. All right, so this is extremely important. Position is huge. Never overlook position. And uh, it incentivizes us to actually play more hands pre-play. 
We'll get into that when we talk about the actions chapter. All right. Another definition we talked about was pot odds. Okay, pot odds uh, is a way of telling us uh, kind of when this uh, pot equity we need, how much pot equity we actually need in order to call. Right? How often we're going to win? That's what we call our equity uh, in order to call. And so we calculated this by saying the probability that we win needs to be greater than or equal to the bet over the pot plus the bet that we have to call. All right. So I'll give you guys a quick example so we can actually see this. So uh, say we have a poker table right here, and uh, let's say that the uh, small blind player put in their 0.5 here, and then uh, the big blind player put in their 1 here, and uh, let's say we're under the gun, right, the first position here, and we decide to open to three big blinds, aka we raise it to three big blinds. We'll talk about why we're doing this later in the execution stage, but let's say we raise this up to three big blinds, right, and then uh, it folds around, okay, and uh, the small blind player folds. And now the action's on the big one player. The big one player is wondering what is their pot odds right now. So go ahead, talk with your neighbor. I'll give you guys a minute. Talk with your neighbor. What is their pot odds and how much equity do they need at minimum in this position uh, to call just based on pot odds? All right, talk to your neighbor. Numerator is how much does how much of a bet does the uh, big blind have to put in additionally in order to match the bet? What do you guys think? Two, two right? Because the current bet on the table is three, so two over. And remember, it's two plus, right? The bet size. And how much of the pot at this time? What do you guys think? Four point five. Perfect. So the one big blind was already in. Now there's three and the point five, so we get four point five. And so this gives us that uh, we need equity uh, greater than or equal to uh, whatever this fraction is, right? 2 over 6.5, so a little bit less than that. All right, cool. Uh, and then we can uh, actually see this in action right here. So these are uh, this is a table. Of course, you don't need to memorize the full table. Just a few nice anchoring numbers so you kind of know the gist of where you're at. It's nice so you don't have to actually do that math in real time. Right? Key thing to note is you actually never have to win half the time in order to call profitably like it may seem on initial glance. Why? Is because um, we have uh, bets, right? The sizes of the pot changes. It's a weighted average. It's not just a raw 50% that we need to win. Right? And so when you throw this weighting into account, uh, it turns it out so that, that we actually don't need to win that large of an amount of time in order to profitably call. All right, cool. And so uh, this is actually one of the mechanics, the pot off mechanic. Uh, of why we don't linearly bet as we go on. We don't just bet one on the flop, one on the turn, one on the river, and the pot grows linearly. It grows exponentially because we bet in proportion of the pot, right, as a percentage of the pot. And we'll be talking about that later when we go to the post flop section. All right. Uh, next definition that's important is implied odds and reverse implied odds, right? So what are these? Implied odds are the situation where we stand to win more money when we actually make our strong hand. Right, so an example of that would be uh, maybe in the flush situation, all right? Say uh, we have uh, the ace of diamonds and the uh, queen of diamonds, and our opponent has the king of diamonds and the nine of diamonds, right? And the board comes down, uh, seven of diamonds, six of diamonds, and uh, the two of spades, all right? So if this happens, then we have a ton of implied odds in this situation having the nut flush because Say the, uh, I don't know, uh, jack of diamonds comes out. Now all of a sudden we have the nut flush. So we have a lot of implied odds, especially in this situation, because our opponent out also made their flush. So here, when we actually made our strong hand, this jack of diamonds landed, we stand to win a lot of money because our opponent also has a good hand, right? Our opponent, on the other hand, has a ton of reverse implied odds with this king of diamonds because it means that we stand to win, lose a lot of money when this jack of diamonds hits because now our opponent has a really, really good hand, right, and we stand to lose a ton of money in that situation, right? So that's implied odds versus implied odds. Question? Uh, is it implied odds or versus implied odds? Like, isn't that from like a third person point of view? Because like, as the king of diamonds, knight of diamonds, we don't know that he has an ace of diamonds. So how would we like, as the king of diamonds, like, 
But if we think that we have an implied odds, we have really one more diamond. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So implied odds, reverse implied odds, exactly. You're asking it from a third person perspective. And generally, yeah, you can kind of think about it like objective, like in the example I gave. But one thing to note is that we know we have the king of diamonds in this position, and we know we have the ace of diamonds in that position. And so this comes to net potential, which I'll discuss in a second. But it's kind of this concept that even when we have one rank less, it makes a massive difference because there's a possibility of reverse implied odds. While when we have the actual nut uh, rank, we know that there is no possibility for the reverse implied odds. So we can always keep in mind the relative hand strength with what's on the board and what we could possibly have to see our hand ranking in terms of that. And by that, we can create our own assumption of what the implied or reverse implied odds would be. Good question. Right? And so this is the reason, this is actually a really nice example uh, of what you were talking about, of why kickers are so important. Right? Kickers are extremely important because of the implied odds they have. When you have the same hand as someone else, a high kicker can make the difference of a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Right? And so this kind of example of kickers could be in the case of a flush or anything else like that. Right? And so uh, kickers, you absolutely know which kickers you have. You don't require an objective opinion to know which kickers you have, uh, but they can make a huge difference in this concept of implied odds. So that's kind of implied odds applied in practical. All right, great. And then the last little definition we need, this is more used in uh, post-flop, but it's also useful in pre-flop if you so desire, is uh, the rule of 2 and 4. And what does that say? That tells us, kind of, it's kind of this gauge of how good our hand might be, of uh, how draws work. So how do draws work? Well, we calculate how many outs we have, and out, remember, is us getting the card that we need in order to uh, make it. So in this case, the Jack of Diamonds was great, but how many other outs do we have? Right? In out, in this case, if we have the Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Diamonds, say this is us, and uh, we really desire to make that flush, what outs would we have in order to get this flush? Right? Talk to your neighbor. What outs do we have in order to get this flush? And then, after that, multiply it by a certain number up here in order to get the percent chance that you actually end up getting that. Right? So go ahead, talk to your neighbor about that. Alright, cool. So a little bit of a tricky example because you don't know your opponent's hand, right? You only know your own hand. So we don't know that the king of diamonds and nine of diamonds are missing. So by our our information we have of these five cards, we know that there's three diamonds that are out on the board. There's 13 diamonds total in the deck, which means there's nine diamonds left that we could possibly get. Alright? Then we look at the rule of two and four. We know we're on the flop, so we multiply by four. Rather than the rule of two would be if we we're on the turn. So there would be a 36% chance that a diamond comes out in either of these two cards. Alright? Awesome. Alright. So, um, last thing in reference of definitions is we'll talk about combos. So, what are combos? We discussed this a little bit later. Combos are any combination of two cards in the deck. Right? So, one combo is the Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Diamonds. Another combo is the King of Diamonds and the Nine of Diamonds. Right? It's kind of like a starting hand that you have. And so, Aces is a, a group of all of these combos containing two Aces, with uh, Ace of Hearts, Ace of Diamonds, and Ace of Clubs, Ace of Hearts, each being a respective combination of, those, uh, of that group. Right? And so, we consider order doesn't matter, right? You can shuffle the two preflop cards you have in your hand as much as you want, and your actual combination doesn't change, it doesn't make any difference. And so we consider uh, order not to matter, and that they're the same combination. And so because order doesn't matter, we uh, divide by 2 here after multiplying 52 by 51, and we know there's 1326 total preflop combinations we can have. All right? The important thing to note is that there is an uneven distribution between hands, between suited cards, unsuited cards, and pocket cards. All right? And this helps us understand the preflop matrix, I'll talk about this matrix in a second, in a better way. So, why is this important? Why is this distribution important? Because it tells us how likely our opponent is to have certain hands and how to construct our range in order to be balanced. All right, so what am I talking about with this matrix? Well, what I'm talking about is that you can actually represent all possible combos that you could have, right? Here, along the diagonal, we have all of our pocket pairs, right? Are having the same pair inside of our pocket, inside of our uh, whole cards, right? The two cards we were dealt pre-flop, right? So these are our uh, pairs. And then on the bottom uh, lower part of this matrix, we have all the offsuit combos, right? So that would be your ace of clubs and king of hearts, or anything like that. 
And then up here we have all of our suited combos. So that'd be ace of hearts and king of hearts, right? A suited combo up here. And so while it looks like there's an equal amount of offsuit and suited combos, when you actually consider the um, combos to make, that make them up, there's actually way fewer suited combos than offsuit combos, right? Each group has a different number of combos of these three. Specifically, pairs have six combos, suited only have four combos, and offsuit have 12 combos. And here's some examples listed out so you can convince yourself of this fact. So in reality, that preflop matrix that we have is actually quite uneven. And we have to keep that in mind when we're playing this guess who game, eliminating our opponent's matrix, and also in calculating our own range and deciding what we want to do. All right? Cool. So, with this in mind, with us understanding what is a matrix, under, us understanding what are hot odds, what are implied odds, and uh, all, and of course the rules of the game itself, understanding that we have our pre-flop two cards. The flop is of course the first three cards that come out, then we're playing a post-flop game in which the turn and then the river come out. Understanding this, uh, we can then come into our pre-flop agenda. All right, what is our pre-flop agenda? There's three possible options that can occur. All right, let's spell out these three options. So, say we're pre-flop here, and let's say that we're uh, playing in the cutoff. Right, the cutoff position right here. So small blind has their 0 0.5, big blind has their 1, and there's the uh, under the gun player. And then uh, what's the next position? Anyone know? Yeah. Hi, Jack. Great. And then? Maybe. Just go straight to the cutoff because we're just playing oh, 6 right. handed Great. Right? And then, of course, after the cutoff, you have the button, and there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 positions. All right, cool. So, say we're in the cutoff here, there's three possible options that can happen. The under the gun player can fold and the hybrid player can fold, in which case it folds to us. We have two options, we can open raise or we can fold. Why don't we check? We'll talk about that in a second. Why don't we call, sorry, call this one. We can do that in a second, we'll talk about that. Second thing is it limps to us, right? Limping to us means that someone just called, they didn't raise. Let's say there's a fold the hybrid player limps one. Right? That's what it looks to us. We can either ISO raise or we can fold. All right? The third option is that someone opens to us. Let's say the under the gun player folds and the high jump player opens. They raise to three uh, for us. We now have three options. A three back call or fold. Okay. So these are the three options that we have. Understanding them, what was I saying of the first thing? I said, why uh, is there no option to just call there? Right? Let's go through the first option, fold, fold. And now the action comes to us. Uh, we have to just call our one big line bet. Right? Well, we don't do that for a very specific reason. We only raise or fold. Why is that? That is known as limping, all right? Limping is uh, this position where a player uh, just calls the big blind bet uh, and decides not to open it, right? Whatever position they may be in. And limping is really bad, all right? We don't limp no matter what. And limping is really bad, why? Because it encourages players uh, to exploit you pretty much. It tells them, it's like raising a flag, a white flag, and saying, I am weak, right? And even if you think you're being deceptive, it's actually even bad if you're being deceptive, right? Because if you're being deceptive, you're just flying this flag saying, I am weak, but you're actually strong, all you're doing is failing to build value in a situation where you want value, right? You have aces, you're pretending to fly a white flag, all right, great, you try to get exploited, the second that you raise back, everybody's gone. So you didn't even get the value that you so desired by being, uh, you know, like by toying with them and then uh, falsely raising up uh, red flag. So we really never want to limp no matter what. It gives us much less fold equity uh, and it also gives us much less uh, actual pot equity and value. So if you limp strong hands, it's really bad. You miss out on a bunch of EV you would get if you're raising. And if you uh, limp weak hands, you're raising this flag telling them to exploit you. So please, never, ever, ever limp. No top poker players limp. All right, cool. And so uh, raising here is fine, and calling is also OK afterwards. Uh, and we'll talk about that. So uh, why is uh, this raise behind OK? And why do we want to raise or fold in this position? Right, when we're here in the cutoff, we never want to actually call that one. We either want to raise or fold. Uh, well, for a few reasons, right? AKA, we don't want to limp, we already know that. So the only two reasons are to fold or raise. And why? We have these three reasons. The first one is for value. As I was saying, we want to build a pot immediately. As soon as we can, we want to throw off on this exponential curve of raising the pot right now where we have a strong hand. The second reason is to build the field. So think about this for a second. This is kind of crazy. Uh, if we have a strong hand like aces, if four or five other people come into the pot with us, 
there's a very large likelihood that they'll actually nail the, uh, nail the flop and they'll actually beat our aces. Even though our aces are way ahead pre-flop, when you have so many people rolling the dice, trying to land something on the flop, it's much more likely that one of them is going to hit. On the other hand, if you ISO, if you isolate to just one other player with you and your aces, they're rolling the dice once and you are also rolling the dice once. And so since your probability is much higher than theirs, you're in a much better position. When five people are rolling the dice against you, even with a low probability, you're not in a very good situation, right? So we like to thin out the field when we have good hands so we can isolate the players, all right? The other reason, lastly, is fold equity, aka we can have some equity, we can win by other people folding, and that's by winning the blinds, right? So um, this can actually add up to a huge amount of money over time, and it's a really important aspect. And so this leads us to our sizing rule. We derived this in class. We're not going to go over it in the review session. But it's three big blinds when you're in an earlier position and two big blinds when you're in a later position. So here in the cutoff, we consider this a later position. So in this case, we just open to a standard two. Uh, if you know your opponent, you can maybe change that a little bit and uh, go up from there to maybe three or something like that. All right? That's our golden rule. Cool. So this is our first situation. Um, but Here's the question, is I just told you guys what to do, it, but I never told you guys when. When do we distinguish between when we fold and when we actually decide to open this? And that takes us back to a matrix, right? And the main idea is that we want to have premium hands in position. That's the golden rule of poker. So in position here, and remember, we want premium hands. This is the aspect of being a tight, aggressive player, right? We're aggressive because we're only raising or folding, we're not limping, so we just became aggressive. But we also want to be a tight, aggressive player. So how do we become tight? We only play premium hands, okay? So instead of just memorizing charts, we think about factors that make a hand premium and that make us a tight player. What are those? That's good pair potential. That means that we'll flop well with whatever hands we have. We have good versatility. That means that we'll draw well with whatever hands we have. And we have good nut potential. That means that it's often the best hand, so we have lots of implied odds that are working in our favor, all right? And so these range charts, which all about, I'm about to show you in a second, uh, kind of altering this matrix, to show us uh, what we want to kind of raise with, open with, pre-flop. Uh, they're not rigid. It's important to understand that we adjust this depending on the opponents we're playing against. And it's also important to understand that stack depths are really important, right? And that they also change how this range looks. So this is a very default range chart without keeping in mind our, our adjustments for stack depth or our adjustments for uh, player type. And so what goes on here? I, I reported this earlier today. Uh, this is just uh, a nice application which can show you pre-flop charts. Uh, when you're, uh, they call it low jack, we'll call it under the gun, uh, this is your preflop chart. As you can see, we like nice pocket pairs because they have great nut potential. They, of course, have good uh, good pair potential because uh, they automatically flop a pair. And then we also like suited cards a lot because they have a lot of uh, flush potential. And we like uh, one gap cards, right, and cards that are pretty close to each other because then we know that they have good straight potential. We generally like them to be the top for the reason of not potential, so they're the best and they're not being uh, overtaken by you know, a worse card in this range. All right, cool. But notice this. As we cycle through to the other positions, as we go to uh, the hijack here, the range increases, right? Because we're in a later position. We are now happier to play in a later position with more marginal hands. Likewise, as we go into the cutoff, it increases even more. And then finally, when we get into the last position uh, on the button, it increases the most. Right? Why? Because we're in the best possession possible, and so when we act later, that's one of our factors in addition to good pair potential, versatility, and nut potential uh, that makes us want to play ahead. Right? So these factors are uh, can become less important. Our threshold of them is lower when we're in a later position, and our threshold of them is much higher when we're in an earlier position. All right, great. So that's how we decide uh, when to uh, three bet, and uh, we talked about the quantity. So there you go, open sizing roll, Three big blinds in the early position, two big blinds in the late position, and uh, and we'll either open raise or fold. We do not win, right? And so with this in mind, we were saying, all right, we don't win. What happens when our opponents win, right? If they're being stupid, let's take advantage of them, right? We can absolutely take advantage of um, them misplaying. And so if it limps to us, let's say here that the hijack player decides to limp, remember, uh, just calling this one big blind rather than opening, uh, how can we then exploit them? So it looks like this, as I was saying, this one big black player limped here, right? And then uh, whatever happens. Uh, and so here what we can do is we should raise to three big lines plus an extra big line for every single limper uh, that exists, each additional limper. And then another extra big line when we're out of position, okay? 
So in this case, uh, let's say the hijack layer here lit. All right, go ahead and talk to your neighbor about what sizing uh, we should end up ISO raising to if we decide to ISO raise, right? Go ahead, talk to your neighbor. What size should we do? Okay. Okay, hopefully you guys discuss and uh, what's the conclusion? Everyone say it. One, two, three. Four big lines. Awesome. Nice and done. So it's four wide because it's three plus the one lever we had. And we are, of course, in a nice position, so we're not going to add our one extra big lever, right? All right, awesome. And uh, generally, this is how much we should do. The question is also when should we ISO raise first fold? It's generally the same as when we're open raising, except it's a little bit tighter. All right, so now we just tighten our range up a little bit more, almost like we're a position later or uh, two positions later in range, and that's kind of when we do it. All right, and now we know the what, we know the when. All right. <laughs> yeah, under the double layer, I just drew a dash. They just they just fold it here. Yeah. If we actually like made this a one two, then this would change. We'd add another extra big line for that player. So then we uh, open the five. Cool. Yeah. Question. So even if it's like. Um, you still want to like, tighten your opening range? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, we love to squeeze, and we also like to tighten up. Right? We want to be a tight and aggressive player. Yeah, exactly. And we might even size up a little bit more when we have a lot of people, so that way we can squeeze even harder. Right? That this concept of uh, raising even higher when there's limpers is called squeezing. Go okay, Cool. All right, last thing is what happens if it opens to us, right? Instead of our opponents being dumb and limping, what if they actually played correctly, and what if they decided to open? So let's say the under the gun player folds, and the hijack correctly opens to three, right? Three is the standard open size that we talked about previously. If you're in like this uh, this position right here, this, uh, uh, what is it, this hijack position. And so what do we decide to do then? Well, first let's talk about what do I mean by three bet call, why is call in parentheses and then fold? Well, here's some quick jargon, all right? A three bet is a raise over an existing raise, AKA this player just raised a three, we then decide to bump it up again, a raise on top of that raise, all right? That's called a three bet. A four bet is then if the button player decided to raise on top of our raise on top of that raise, right? So that is a four bet. All right, cool, that's just the jargon and we go up from there, all right? And so when we're trying to steal, right, AKA we're trying to kind of squeeze, we're trying to get the brides out of the way, we hate getting three bet because then we just have to fold, right? So an example, is um, let's say that uh, we get fold, fold, fold. We're here in the button and we're trying to steal those blinds away, right? So we have a semi marginal hand, right? That's why there's so many semi marginal hands. We have position and we have the ability to steal. And we decide to open the three here, maybe even higher, maybe even two, somewhere around there, whatever. Um, and then instead of the small blind player, big blind player folding like we'd like them to do, they end up three betting, they end up raising. To let's say seven or something like that, right? We really hate this because now we don't steal the blinds, right? So three betting is extremely powerful uh, across the board. It's a very powerful strategy, right? And so there's two options here: there's three betting light, which is with a wider range of hands, and there's three betting tight, which is with very strong hands, right? Just like we'll see C betting light and tight later. Uh, there's kind of this this concept of of being light or tight. All right, cool. And so how should we three bet? If we're in position, we should generally three bet about three x. And when we're out of position, generally we bet about 4.5 hours, right? And so how does that end up working out? Well, whatever the current raise size is, we should raise the 3x and then add an additional 1x for every call. Okay, so in this case, if uh, we have the under the gun player fold and the hijack player open to 3, uh, go ahead and talk to your neighbor. How much should we open to now in the cutoff if we desire to 3 bet? What do we think? Talk to your neighbor.
All right, so what do you guys think? Uh, one, two, three. Nine, and I agree with you guys, right? Three times this three bet gets us nine right here. All right, awesome. And so uh, generally, keep in mind, just as we uh, narrowed our range for ISO -E, we're going to narrow it even more when we decide to three bet, right? We're going to have a very, very tight range. We're only going to be three betting about 8% of our overall hands, right? So a very small range. And you can tell a loose player immediately because they're three betting way more than that proportion. Right? And so, therefore, uh, that's kind of our idea of uh, three bet. All right. The next question is, when do we call versus three bet? Right. In the other ones, we just have this nice little uh, dichotomy. We pick one or the other. We're good. But why do we have this third option call right here? And why is it optional? Why is it in parentheses here? Well, because there's actually two bet two different three betting strategies. There's a polar three betting strategy, or there's a linear three betting strategy. Okay. A polar three betting strategy is when we actually involve the call. All right, these blue uh, colored ones right here are calls. Our red ones are three bet bluffs, right? Our light three bets, and our uh, like teal ones here, our light green ones are our three bet values. All right, um, and so these three bet values, of course, we, we need to mix them with bluffs in order to kind of lay out our range evenly. And we like using the polar three betting strategy whenever we have a lot of fold equity. All right, when you're playing against tighter opponents, then a three bet bluff over here might actually end up getting through because you're playing against tighter people. And our opponents are less likely to raise our race, aka a 4-bet, we're really happy with that. Because if you 3-bet bluff and you get a 4-bet, you're crying, right? We were just trying to get fold equity, and now they're coming after us, right? On the other hand, a linear strategy is really useful whenever you don't have much fold equity, right? Bluffs are not making it through, your opponents are not folding a lot, they're pretty passive. Uh, that's when we want to employ more of a linear 3 betting strategy, right? Against looser opponents. And also when you don't want to just flat call. So this only happens on the small blind. Um, and when there's aggro players behind, right? So if you're uh, kind of here in the small blind, uh, if you just simply call playing a polar strategy, you can really get squeezed super hard by the big blind player or anything like that, right? And we really don't want that to happen. So that's kind of when we apply a uh, polar versus linear three batting strategy, and that's why the call is optional. If you're in a polar situation, that's the situation where we might actually call, and if you're in a linear situation, that's the situation when uh, we're just going to be three betting or folding. Right? Cool. And so there you go. This is our mini flop options. Congratulations. We made it through the first like five weeks of lecturing, right? Uh, where there's these three options, and these are kind of the general three things that we like to do. All right? And the when uh, we decide to do each of those things, remember, are determined by four factors our position, our good pair potential, our non potential, and our versatility. Right? And so we're considering all those things with the actual hands we have, and uh, we just saw some examples of which hands are uh, really strong with those. Alright, great. Uh, one quick thing. Of, oh, yeah, question. Yeah. Stack size make a massive difference, right? Just as player types do as well. If we're playing against super aggressive opponents, when you play differently, and if we're playing against super passive opponents, so yeah, it makes it absolutely different. It's something we should definitely consider. We'll be talking about it more like later in the lecture, uh, later in the uh, in the semester. Yeah. It makes a huge difference for difference for post flop playing, especially. All right, right. So yeah, a little bonus briefly uh, for betting. So when we four bet, this is a, a very common <coughs> blunder. Is we don't continue the same three betting strategy we employed before. When we decide to four bet, we actually decrease our sizing a little bit. Right? In position, it's only about two point one x, and out of position, it's only about two point three x. So here's our example here. Uh, the under the gun player decides to open to three big blinds, right? Standard open, 3x, we like that. The hijack player decides to three bet to nine big blinds, right? That's the 3x you get because there's no other callers. That makes sense. We're good so far. That's what we covered in the example. Um, and then the cutoff here decides to go to 19 big blinds. All right, talk with your neighbor. How did we get this 19 big blinds? And why are we not raising it up to 27 big blinds to 3x, right? Why are we not doing 3x? Talk to your neighbor.
All right, cool. So, um, reason why? Can anyone tell me? Closer, it does put us in a really tough spot, but not really because close spot, because the head will just end right here, right? So it's set in the top little thing right here. If we raise three x, uh, then it pretty much just puts them in a position to either call or shove. They don't really have to think about a five bet because with our stack sizes we have at this point, they're pretty much just all in because three x is just so massive. So they don't have to think, and it puts us in a tough position because we have to go all in pretty much then if we're facing uh, that position of them for that. So it makes it really easy for them to make a decision, and then it backfires and bites us, and it makes it really hard for us. Cool. And so that's why we only go a little bit less. We only go to like 2.1-ish, uh, or 2.3 if you're out of position to charge them a little bit. All right, awesome. So we don't want to make life easy for them. So this is around 2.1x, not 3x. That's kind of the main gist of it. All right, great. Cool, so that's pre-flop. Now, let's finally go into post-flop. Let's talk about the definitions first, as I did. And then we'll go into the actual uh, content and actions that we're doing. Okay, so post flop, what's going on? First thing, board texture. All right, we discussed board texture. This is kind of how the flop can connect with different potential hole cards that your villain or you might have. Okay, a dry flop is a flop that does not connect as well, and a wet flop is a flop that connects uh, much more. All right, and so in general, the more ways that a flop can connect with your opponent's range, the less likely they are to fold. And the less plus EV a light C bet is going to be. A light C bet being uh, when the flop comes out, we decide to kind of bluff. And we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So here's some examples. A bone dry flop, aka a dop, a dry ass flop, uh, is stuff like King 7 2 all offsuit, um, right? Stuff like that is really not ideal. And we can go all the way up to the, the waff, the wet ass <coughs> flop, which is uh, we have these two suits. They're really, they're close next to each other, so we have great straight potential. Uh, these are all the same suit, right? So a flush could have hit right off of the flop itself, and uh, they're again very close to each other. They're high ranking cards, right? They're very likely to have connected with any hold cards, right? Versus the top ones are very unlikely to have connected with any hold cards, right? And then, um, whoops, and then another thing is a showdown value, right? That's, we talked about board texture. Now it's showdown value. Showdown value is how likely that hand is to win at showdown. So it kind of comes across this spectrum, and Tony did a really nice job uh, illustrating this with an example, is saying the flop is ace, draft, deuce. Now you have value at showdown right now because you have your set, right? Your three of a kind is disguised. There's not much better that can happen. And uh, even with uh, the rest of the cards coming out, since we're rainbow, it's unlikely that a flush is gonna hit, and the straights are, it's not too connected to the board either. And so, and it's very likely to get connected by worse hands, right? For example, ace king could very easily call, ace jack could very easily call, ace queen, um, anything like that could very easily call and get absolutely smashed by these. So we call that a value uh, showdown value. If you had stable showdown value, like ace eight, we have ace pair, and then we have a, a kind of semi-low kicker, uh, can win at showdown, um, and uh, rarely uh, does it become any weaker, right? It's kind of maintaining its rank relatively, and so we'd say that that's stable showdown value. On the other hand, vulnerable showdown value will often become weaker as we go along, right? So jack nine, while this jack pair exists, a queen or king could come out, uh, the board could pair, et cetera, et cetera, and it could make the hand much weaker as we go forward versus a top pair, much less so because obviously a queen or king is coming out. And lastly, eight nine has absolutely no showdown value. We need it to improve in order to actually have anything when it comes to the showdown, right? So we don't really have much right now. All right, and so here's some examples. Uh, six seven on a board of queen three two has absolutely nothing, versus ace jack on a board of ace nine three has a lot, and it's important to understand the difference between vulnerable and stable showdown value. A uh, vulnerable showdown value with ace three, as you can see, we have bottom pair; it's not looking the best. Versus stable sh showdown value, we kind of have this middle pair, and we actually have this king as well blocking. If a king comes out, we actually lend the pair. It's not like it can become much weaker. Awesome. <clears throat> Last definition we should cover that's pretty important is multi-weightness. If there's more people 
um, it makes it much harder for us to block. If there's less people, it makes it much easier for us to block, right? Because um, there's a certain chance that each person, it's like, again, rolling the dice, that each person is going to fold to our block. And when we roll these dice three times, it makes it much more likely that one of them is going to land and that person is actually going to call us. Versus if we're only against one player, then we only roll the dice once, and so it's much less likely that they're going to call us when we're bluffing. Right? So uh, we definitely don't want to be multi-way when we're bluffing. All right, last, sorry, definition is uh, the concept of the capped range. And the capped range is this concept that uh, whenever a player decides to call rather than raise, they limit themselves and they cut off the top portion of their range right here. So we'll look at this example specifically. In this hand, the uh, small blind player has their 0.5, the big blind player has their 1. It then folds to, uh, or sorry, then it just goes to the under the gun player. Under the gun player decides to uh, open here to uh, 3. The small blind player folds, and the big blind player decides to call the 3. Okay, the total pot here is 6.5. And notice the action of what happened. The under the gun player opened, right? But they never actually called again. So their range here is uncapped. They could have any of these amazing hands. On the other hand, the big blind player here capped their range. They decided to just call instead of bet it up more to the three bet. And because they just decided to call instead of three bet, we know they can't have one of those super premium hands because they would have three bet with them, right? That's called capping your range of hands you could possibly have. Right, cool. And so therefore, this other gun player has a range advantage. Their range has much better hands than this big blind player. Right? Big blind player has a bunch of garbage down here. Ace five off. They have a seven six off suit versus the uh, under the gun player with an uncapped range has considerably stronger hands across their range. All right. Cool. So uh, with this in mind, we can now kind of talk about what actually happens when we're going forward. So there's the exponential mistake, super important. What does this tell us? This tells us that the pot grows exponentially. I was telling you guys about this before. And so the mistake is to bet too small on previous streets, expecting the pot to grow a ton later. It's not, right? We've got to grow as we go, and uh, that allows it to grow exponentially and really uh, allows to achieve maximum value. And so we're missing bets that are essential to building the pot as we go through by just playing possibly, right? We want to be a tight, aggressive player. This is where the aggression comes. So an undersized or missed bet actually costs much more than just the value of the bet on that street because it exponentially grows as we go forward. Uh, and then also there's a pot building and elasticity. As against fish, uh, we need to size sufficiently large. A very common mistake is to undersize value bets thinking that we're kind of milking them and uh, leaving them on the call, right? I don't want to bet so big that they fold. And so this is called milking syndrome, and it's actually minus EV, right? Larger bets are higher EV, even if they get called less often. So we really want to make sure that we size up on our value bets and make sure that they're doing really good. And especially against fish, we can actually size down on our bluffs because they won't notice the difference. Against regs, we have to be a little bit more careful. All right, great. So with these in mind, let's actually go through it and let's actually understand it. So, uh, we have the procedural check in the C bet. I mentioned the C bet. What's the C bet? What's the procedural check? Let's go through it. So, whoever the pre flop aggressor is, the person with the uncapped range, they are the person who's considered the pre flop aggressor. They're the person who C bets. The person who capped their range, they are known as the non aggressor, and they are just going to procedurally check. So, let's take a look at an example here. Small left player bets 0.5, big left player bets 1, under the gun player raises to 3. And then the uh, small blind folds, big blind calls the two. All right, we have our 6.5, same action as before. Notice what happened. Our under the gun player is uncapped. They were the aggressor, right? So they are the preflop aggressor. On the other hand, the big blind player right here, they capped their range. They are the non aggressor. And so they are the, I don't know, non aggressor. All right, whatever. The procedural check is a check by default, made by the non-aggressor of the previous street. In this case, the previous street from the flop is pre-flop. At pre-flop, the big blind player was the non-aggressor. And so they're going to procedurally check after the flop comes down. OK, whatever the flop comes down, A64 in the uh, they're going to check. Right? That's called the procedural check. If we're out of position, AKA okay, we're the second person to act, and, uh, and we just called this raise with a non-aggressor pre-flop, then we're going to check 
100% of the time post flop. This is known as the procedural check, right? And so very similar to whipping, uh, why is this the case? Um, it's because by raising, uh, the villain is telling us that they have a strong hand uh, with their uncapped range, and so we need to be really careful with that, and by betting, we just lose money by default. And by checking our strong hands, we're actually protecting our weak hands from light c notes, right? Because then, if we uh, just checked with our weak hands, uh, only then let's see butts could absolutely throw us out of the water. So we always procedurally check, right? If we don't do that, that's known as a dog bet, and that's really dumb. So in this case, the big man player in our example, say we're the cut off instead of the under gun, uh, decides to bet that five big ones. That's really stupid, and that's a blunder that is a dog bet. We don't do that. We would procedurally check in this situation. Okay, cool. What about the other player in this game, right? We know that the uh, non aggressor should should procedurally check. What about the preflop aggressor? Well, they should either check behind or see bet. Okay, a see bet is made by this preflop aggressor, this razor, and it can fall in one of two categories a value see bet or a light see bet. Okay, a value see bet is when someone has a strong hand and they think they're going to get called by weaker hands, right? That was like the value showdown value you saw before. Okay, then you also have a light see bet. A light see bet is when uh, you don't have as much of a strong hand, but you're still trying to pick up the pot just going through it. Okay? So proper see betting is extremely important in post flop play, and uh, we'll kind of go through this uh, in a little bit more detail. So, how big should we size it? As we talked about before, we knew our sizing, so when we decided to ISO, or when we decided to 3 bet, etc. For see betting, it depends not on uh, uh, other factors besides really uh, how wet or dry the flop is and how weak or strong your range is. Okay? So in this case, the out of the gun player has a really strong range because they're in a bad position, which means that the range was really narrow to start with, and they're uncapped. So they have a really, really strong range right here. Right? And depending on how the flop comes out, if we have a really wet flop, uh, that favors us and we should be able to see that quite much. On the other hand, if it's a fairly dry flop, uh, that's when we're going to uh, size a little bit smaller. Right? And so when do we decide to light seed bet versus just fold? It's if our board texture is dry, aka we could just have a nice small sizing of seed betting. Uh, if our, uh, we have good equity, if we get called, right, we know we can make it to future streets. If the villain often folds, because this is a bluff, right, so we want them to have lots of fold equity on this. And uh, if we have vulnerable or no showdown value, we talked about what that was previously. Uh, if we have a heads up pop, remember multi lateness is terrible for bluffing. And we have a good turn and river prospects, right? We have uh, a lot to go for in the future, right? We, we have some draws, some nice draws. And lastly, if we're in position, it's always nice to be in position. Those are good factors for light sea betting. So it's really a kind of a bluff and the different factors that go into making a good bluff. On the other hand, what about value bets? When do we want to value sea bet? Well, uh, we should be thinking about our relative hand strength. What's relative hand strength? That means of the hands that are possible to have on the board, would we fall among them? Right, if a flush is possible, that should be involved in relative hand strength. But if a flush isn't even possible, we can eliminate a flush and all straight flushes, royal flushes, etc. on the board. If the board isn't paired, then quads and full houses aren't possible. Okay, so we can only we only need to look relatively to what hands are possible of the strength of our hand. We don't have to look all the way to the top. Then the second question about uh, if we should value that is do we need to build the pot? It's almost always yes. Again, don't make the exponential mistake thinking we can get value later. It wants to grow as we go right now. And so the answer is really only no when they have a short stack, because then we know that uh, we're going to get all their money in in later streets anyway, so we don't have to worry about that exponential mistake. Or when they're an aggro fish maniac. When they're going crazy throwing money in all the time, then we can be a little bit slower and we don't have to actually go to the right now. And that's kind of this question of slow play, right? We have value, but we're deciding not to bet. We're deciding just to check right now. Uh, it's pretty much mainly uh, when we absolutely crush the deck, and uh, there's pretty much, it's very unlikely that the villain has a hand that they could even call us with. Right? We're not going to get value, they're just going to fold if we bet. So we just want to make them continue along, so hopefully they get something they're willing to give us money with. Or they're, again, super aggressive. Yeah, question. I have a quick question back to uh, this checking. Oh, yeah, so why is people checking not considered yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good question. Okay, so first question is why do we not win? Uh, because Lumping uh, doesn't go to the pot, mm -hmm. so it shows that our range is capped. Yeah, we cap our range and we're not building the pot. In this case, 
We're not having our range by procedurally checking because it's always done. Okay, so we ignore that aspect, right? The other aspect is what? Oh, building the pot. Yeah, building the pot. And here we don't have to worry about it because our opponent's going to light CBET or value CBET a large proportion of the time. And so we're going to be able to build a pot in this. And plus, if they check behind, we can now actually build a pot on the turn because we have future streets in which we're able to do that. So it's not as not nearly as much of a show of weakness. In fact, it's no show of weakness because we do it across the board. That'd be like if we decided to limp every single hand uh, pre-flop, right? Which would be really weird because then we'd get no value and our range would be super weird. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, this is kind of our aspect of uh, value betting and when we decide to value. Right? <coughs> awesome. Cool, and so um, that's kind of this is the sizes. We talked about the size. We talked about when we want to see bet. Uh, generally, if you just bet half a pot, if you don't know what's going on, that should be okay. But really try to size your see bets accordingly uh, to this kind of idea because it's really a massive amount of EV that you can gain from changing. All right, next thing we'll talk about briefly, uh, nearing towards the end of the selection now, is uh, minimum defense frequency. Minimum defense frequency is uh, kind of this idea of, uh, you know, Nash equilibrium we were thinking about before, of how is our opponent kind of altering their bluffing versus their value betting, how often are they actually pulling this off, and us adjusting accordingly. So it's the percentage of the overall range that we need to call a range raise with in order to prevent them from exploiting us by over bluffing or under bluffing. And we calculate this by just dividing the pot size, divided by the pot size plus bet. And it's kind of this idea right here depicted by this uh, chart that our defending frequency, we always defend, then they should never bluff. And if they bluff, and if we uh, never defend, they should bluff all the time. And so for that reason, we should be somewhere in the middle. We should defend some middle frequency of the time, so that way they don't have any advantage in over or under bluffing uh, the mission. Right? So if we fold more often, then they can steal profitably, uh, then that's when we do that. And if we fold less than that, then uh, they can actually bluff less and make money with their value as well. So that's what we want to do. So I pulled up an example here because MDF is a little bit theoretical, and I thought it would be nice to do an actual calculation. So we have a calculation here. Uh, let's go through this. The weird dealt uh, jack-10 suited on the button. I'll draw this out for you guys. We're on the button here. We're dealt jack-10 uh, suited, right, both parts. And uh, the under the gun player folds. The middle position player here uh, raises to five. Okay, uh, we're playing, what, one, two? Yeah, one, two. So they raise to five. Let's say uh, small blind, big blind, one, two. Middle position player decides to raise to five. And then, um, let's see, the hero, uh, us, we decide to call this five behind. We're not three betting, because we don't three bet that often, uh, especially with a hand like Jack-10 suited, right? Not nearly strong enough to three bet. And then uh, uh, we get folds uh, off here and here with the small and big blind. All right, cool. Flop comes down, 10 of spades, 9 of hearts, and uh, 3 of spades. And this uh, middle position player, remember, they were the pre-flop aggressor, so they decide to, what's the term? Spell that term? C-bet. So they decide to C-bet to 8.5. And then off of this 8.5, we then decide to call behind it. Okay, who is the aggressor on this street? On the pre-flop street, it was clearly the middle position player. On this street, again, it was uh, this middle position player because they again put in money and we just called. So they're still the aggressor and they decided to do what on the turn? See that? Yes. So they see that again on the turn. We again decide to call. All right, and then we go ahead and we see a river. And the river, they again decide to see that. Because they were the aggressor on the previous street. Remember, any street, if they're the previous street aggressor, they then have the opportunity to see that. And they decided to see that 37.5. Of course, uh, along those, the six of diamonds and the uh, ace of uh, hearts decided to come out. And so now, with this in mind, how often should we be calling in order to present, prevent the villain from exploitatively over bluffing? All right, keep in mind the formula before. It's the pot size divided by the pot size plus bet size. And go ahead and think about it. Uh, what, how often should we actually decide to call? Of course, we're not 
lazy in this situation, how often should we call it to prevent them from overflowing? All right, talk to your neighbor. All right, what do people think? Can anyone raise their hand, tell me? If anyone has an idea? It's a day if you're wrong. Yeah. 67. All right, let's see. So what do we do? We plug in this $75 bet size, right? And uh, we divide that by 75 plus 37.5. So the bet size divided by the pot plus the bet size. Yeah, there we go. We get our nice 67.67, which is the minimum defense frequency. So 67% of the time. So if they were bluffing on this uh, bet right here, this bet would have to force a fold at least 33% of the time in order to make a profit. So in order to prevent them from over bluffing, we need to end up calling more often than 33% of the time. Okay, if we call more often than that, then we prevent them from exploiting it. All right, that's idea. <clears throat> and so what does this result in? Why is this important? Uh, they, since they only have to call MDF percent of the range uh, facing our bet, we know then that we can keep reducing their range size by MDF percent as we go along. So. From here, having 50% of the range, range hands, <coughs> their range is 50% uh, if they just call pre-flop. We then know uh, with the C-bet on the uh, flop that we reduce it to 25% of hands, right? Because it's decreasing by, let's say, 50% right here for MDF percent. Then again, it decreases by 50% uh, on our call uh, turn, if we call the turn, and again by 50% when we call the river. And so as you can see, this guess who game, we progressively eliminate all of these cards, we swipe them down as we eliminate and we go onwards because we're decreasing by MDF percent every time. Because we know that's their defense frequency, that's how often we need to be calling in order to make them not overblown. And so it's that proportion of the hands that we end up calling for. How we raise them. Awesome. <coughs> and so lastly, uh, we'll talk about thin value in position versus out of position. So uh, being checked to in position is absolutely fantastic, right? When we do that, uh, then we can now realize the full equity of our hand. If we want to check, we realize the full equity. If we want to bet, we can do that and send it back to them, uh, and we never have to fold, right? We never actually lose out on equity that our hand had if it was actually realized. We always get to realize that, so it's really cool, right? So we really like that. And so uh, we can either bet for thin value in that circumstance, or we can check, and we always uh, realize that equity. Here's the issue, is what happens when we're out of position, or if we're in an earlier street? Then we have something called ghost equity, right? Ghost equity is where we can't actually realize all of our hands uh, true equity. So the equity we have in that situation is broken up into ghost equity, which is on future streets, and assuming that we don't get that space to us, and uh, that, all have, that all gets killed in the ghost equity, and our true equity is only what we have at this moment without regarding the future bets we're going to have, right? So when we calculate pot odds, that's not incorporating ghost equity because, or it's falsely rather incorporating ghost equity because it's assuming we have already realized that right now, when in reality in the future, uh, it's not necessary that we may actually realize it when we're facing continual bets. So ghost equity is this uh, equity that we have against their betting range in an open action spot that's not actually fully realizable. But true equity is when uh, we're kind of done with that. Uh, and so we have that against them, and it's more likely to be get realized and show that. All right. And so that takes us to end of position spots uh, where we have these three different lines. So uh, when we're in an end of action spot, uh, then we'll actually realize our equity, and it's really nice. And uh, sorry, when we're in an out of action pos position, we may not actually realize our equity. And so we then have these three lines to do depending on where, what our opponent does. So we can either bet fold line. Remember, we're out of position. So we're the first to act. We decide to bet, 
And then if they decide to raise us, we decide to fold. This happens uh, mainly if uh, on a thin value event for them to call and then we realize a value. We can check call, which can happen uh, in order to call bluffs, or we can check fold, uh, which is really, uh, we're just trying to fold and it's really just not a good situation. But we don't necessarily lose because of course we're checking too though, we can still sometimes realize our equity. And so just some final notes that kind of finishes up how much of post-flop we've done this far. Um, oftentimes, uh, when we're playing poker, uh, by this point many of you guys have played live poker or at least in class you guys have been playing, uh, it's very easy to become result-oriented, which is where you judge a play or several hands based on that result specifically. So here, uh, in the big blind, we're playing 2-7 offsuit, which we should never be playing, right? And so since the flop came down, ace-2-2, two, two, we're thinking we're geniuses, we landed the, uh, the trips, we're like, we should always be playing 2-7 offsuit, it's our lucky hand, right? That's really not a good idea to do, and that's being result-oriented, right? And so try not to kind of think like that. Try not to judge yourself on individual hands on being good or bad. Uh, sometimes a lot of people will fold a hand and then they see it was like a royal flush. And they're like, God, I should always play that hand in the future. No, uh, that just happened to be the circumstance. And if we actually do the math in the long run, it is not profitable to do, even if in the short run it might happen. So don't try to, uh, like, don't fall victim to these logical fallacies. Uh, don't look at what happens at a particular time. Instead, focus on sound logical play over thousands of hands. Okay, and so um, here's a nice example: uh, not buying lightning bolt damage insurance and then getting zapped by a lightning bolt. You think to yourself, "Damn, I'm such a fool. I should have gotten lightning bolt damage insurance." Uh, that's being results oriented. So don't do that, please. And so uh, this is a nice little chart of it in reference to poker, where uh, if we have some plus EV play. Over time, we might actually lose money in the short term, but over time, we will end up actually realizing our $8 uh, uh, dollar expected value. Because expected value just means across all variants, uh, kind of simplifying across our variants in the short term, we'll end up realizing it in the end. So that's kind of why the results oriented thing is bad, because even if we made a plus EV play, which we don't know that it's a plus EV play, uh, we could have actually lost money in the short term. And when that happens, we're thinking to ourselves, damn, we should never do that play again. Right? Or we might have a minus EV play, and we might gain money in the short term. And we might be thinking that's a great play. But don't do that. Think about how to be, think logically. Think of uh, in the long term and in the long run of EV. And in uh, the long term, it'll end up actually uh, realizing out to whatever that is. Right? EV exactly translates to profit, and luck is actually a minimal factor. Yeah? Um, would you say there's like a number of hours or plans, sessions, or like items that would be that is a great question, and uh, we're going to get to that exactly right now. The next few slides. So, um, yeah, so making money in poker uh, is not really a joke, right? And we can think about that in reference to winning a ton of hands as we go along. And so, when do we actually make money? Well, we talk about it in terms of big blinds per uh, 100. That's kind of how you think about it. And so, 10 big blinds per 100, uh, we would generally then think over 10,000 hands. That's just to kind of simplify our variance if we had like, let's say, 100 uh, SR variants, right? So that's a ton of hands, 10,000 hands. That takes hours and hours and hours, uh, pretty much years of your played live play to end up actually realizing uh, a play regularly. And so playing 51, you'd expect to make $1,000 over 10,000 hands. That would take 20 to 50 hours online, considerably more, uh, more than double that for in person. Um, if you're actually getting that 10 blade blinds per 100 after rate, uh, you're still going to lose money 13% of the time, right? Because variance still exists. That's still playing 20 to 50 hours online, not enough to actually fully get rid of your variance, even being a plus 10 big blind player. So if you're playing 40 hours in a week, um, you're expecting to win $52,000, and that's if you're a very good, consistent player. Um, of course, if you're winning that much, you should actually really be going up in stakes. But uh, think about that in reference to everything else, right? So that 40 hours a week you're playing in order to uh, get that $52,000 playing 51, uh, would it be better if you put that in the leak code? Or uh, what happens if you read books on self-improvement or something, right? So really, I, I think the general idea of, of these last few slides is uh, what type of investment do you want to do in order to kind of have more happiness and wealth in the long run? Um, that's kind of the main gist of this. Keep in mind variance exists. Don't think of the short term. That's kind of the gist of today's lecture. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we'll have a short play session. Other than that, uh, I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you.